Do you believe in ghosts? You just might, after this story. Imagine, if you will, a quiet, unassuming woman living a seemingly ordinary life in Chicago. A life filled with music and caring for her patients as a respiratory therapist. But beneath the surface of her mundane existence lurked a chilling secret. A secret so dark and twisted that it would send shivers down your spine and leave you questioning the very fabric of reality. And on a cold February night in 1977, the unthinkable happened. The woman was brutally murdered in her own apartment, her body discovered beneath the charred remains of a fire set to cover the grisly crime. The case went cold and her killer walked free. But her story was far from over. It was about to enter the realm of the unbelievable. What if I told you that this innocent murder victim did not rest in peace? What if I told you instead that her spirit lingered, determined to reveal the truth and seek justice from beyond the grave? You probably wouldn't believe me. Hell, neither would I. Somehow, the woman was able to detail the events of her murder through someone she'd never even met. But how is that even possible? In this episode of Still Unsolved, we look at the case of Tarasita Bassa, also known as the woman who solved her own murder. Teresita Bassa was born and raised in the Philippines as the sole child of a distinguished and affluent family. She completed her education at Assumption College in Manila before moving to the United States. There, she earned a master's degree in music from Indiana University. Despite her deep passion for music, Teresita eventually chose to pursue a career in healthcare, becoming a respiratory therapist. By 1977, at the age of 47, Teresita was content with her life. She resided in Chicago and worked at Edgewater Hospital. She had also decided to return to school and was working on her doctoral thesis in music at Loyola University. In her limited free time, she offered piano lessons from her apartment. So far, all was going well with Teresita. But sadly, her fruitful life was coming to a tragic end. On Monday, February 21st, 1977, Teresita's day had been uneventful. After completing her regular shift at the hospital, she returned to her apartment at 2740 North Pine Grove Avenue. At around 7.30 p.m., she received a phone call from her friend Ruth Loeb. They chatted for about 20 minutes before Teresita mentioned she needed to end the call as she was expecting a male visitor Ruth did not inquire about the man's identity or any other details. At 8.40 p.m., a couple living down the hall from Teresita noticed a smoke smell but couldn't locate the source. Worried, Merritt and Catherine Naz contacted the building's janitor, who immediately called the Chicago Fire Department and began evacuating the residents. By the time firefighters arrived, the hallway near Merritt and Catherine's apartment was quickly filling with smoke. Firefighters quickly identified apartment 15B, Teresita's residence, as the source of the smoke. Forcing entry, they managed to extinguish the flames within minutes. However, their relief turned to horror when they discovered that the fire had been deliberately set. Beneath a mattress, they found Teresita's body. She was naked with a kitchen knife deeply embedded in her chest. Detectives arrived at the scene and quickly confirmed that they were dealing with a homicide. It appeared that the perpetrator had started the fire to eliminate any evidence of the crime. After killing Teresita, the murderer had piled clothing on top of her and ignited it. They then placed her mattress over her body and set it ablaze as well. Given that Teresita was found nude, detectives initially suspected she had been assaulted before being killed. However, they were taken aback when the autopsy revealed no signs of an assault. Despite the fire's destruction of some potential evidence, police could clearly see that Teresita's apartment had been ransacked. It was obvious that a struggle had taken place. However, they could not ascertain if anything was missing, since Teresita lived alone and no one was aware of the exact contents of her apartment. It was possible, though, that a robbery had occurred. 
Detectives meticulously searched the apartment for clues that might lead them to the killer, but it appeared the perpetrator had left no physical evidence behind. Among the few items collected was a memo Teresita had seemingly written to herself, reminding her to get theater tickets for the initials, A and S. Investigators had no leads on who that might be, or how recently she had written the note, but they were keen to identify and locate this mysterious individual. In the following weeks, homicide detectives interviewed Teresita's friends, co-workers, neighbors, and classmates. They learned that she was a quiet and courteous woman, deeply committed to her job and well-respected by her patients. Though she occasionally dated, she had never married and appeared content with her work at the hospital and her music studies. She had no known enemies, and those who knew her were stunned that anyone would want to harm her. Throughout the investigation, detectives learned much about Teresita's character but found no clues leading them closer to her killer. Despite making several public appeals for information, they received few tips and were unable to develop any solid leads. Within a few months, the case went cold. The investigators were beginning to feel a loss of hope that this case would ever be solved. And then they were met with a mysterious tip from an even more mysterious source. In July of 1977, the investigation saw renewed activity when Detective Joe Stashla arrived at work to find a note on his desk. As he picked it up and read it, he saw a familiar name. The note was asking him to contact the Evanston Police Department regarding Teresita Bass's murder. Intrigued, Stashla immediately called and learned that Evanston Police had received a call from someone claiming to have information about the case. He was instructed to contact Dr. Jose Chua, a physician residing in Skokie, which is a suburb of Chicago. Detective Stashla and his partner, Detective Lee Eplin, arranged to interview Chua at his home. Surprisingly, he provided them with crucial information that would ultimately solve the murder case, but in a manner they had never anticipated. Dr. Chua appeared noticeably uncomfortable as he began to share his knowledge. After some initial small talk, he cautiously asked the detectives if they had any beliefs in the occult or supernatural. Although they tried to keep open minds, a quick exchange of glances revealed their skepticism and the suspicion that their visit to Skokie might be a wild goose chase. Eventually, Dr. Chua continued. He confided to the detectives that he believed his wife, Remy, had been possessed by the spirit of Terry Zitabasa. Remy was also from the Philippines and had been experiencing strange dreams involving Teresita. She tried to dismiss them, but one day, while asleep, she entered a trance-like state and began speaking to her husband in a voice that wasn't her own. Dr. Chua told the detectives that Remy had appeared almost comatose while speaking to him, and the voice she used was unfamiliar to him. The voice identified itself as Teresita Bassa, and she was pleading for his help. She claimed that she had been murdered by a man named Alan Showery and urged him to take this information to the police. Through Remy, Teresita insisted that Alan had come to her apartment under the pretense of fixing her television, but had killed her instead. After making yet another desperate plea for him to inform the authorities, the voice faded away. When Remy awoke from her nap, she had no memory of what had occurred. Upon hearing her husband's account of the incident, she stared at him in bewilderment. Joe, still grappling with the strangeness of what he had witnessed, decided against contacting the police at that moment. After all, who would believe him? The following week, the same phenomenon occurred. Once again, while Remy appeared to be asleep, she began speaking to Joe in the same voice as before. This time, the voice was angry and demanded to know why Joe had not yet contacted the police. Joe played along, explaining that as a doctor with a scientific mindset, he could not go to the authorities without concrete evidence linking Alan Showery to Teresita's murder. Irritated, the voice promised to provide proof. She revealed that Alan had stolen several unique pieces of jewelry from her apartment 
which her father had acquired in France and given to her mother. Alan had then given the stolen jewelry to his girlfriend. The voice even provided the names and phone numbers of four people who could identify the jewelry. Still uncertain about the situation, but wanting to protect his wife from further episodes, Joe ultimately decided to contact the police. That is how Stashla and Eplin found themselves in Joe's living room. The detectives were initially skeptical of his story, but they noticed the name that Joe provided matched the initials on the memo Teresita had written to herself. It seemed there might be some credibility to his claim. Regardless, it was the first lead they had in months, and they figured it wouldn't hurt to investigate further. After conducting a background check on Alan, the detectives were surprised to discover that he lived near Teresita and also worked at Edgewater Hospital, though in a different department. Conversations with Alan's co-workers revealed a startling fact. Several of them recalled Alan mentioning that he had gone to fix Teresita's television. With this new information, the detectives decided it was time to visit Alan. They arrived at his apartment, unannounced, and found both Alan and his girlfriend, Yanka Kamluk, at home. After exchanging pleasantries, they asked Alan if he would be willing to accompany them to the police station. They explained that they were investigating Teresita's murder and believed he might be able to assist. Alan agreed to go with them. During their interview with Alan, he initially denied ever visiting Teresita's home. However, when confronted with the fact that several people had overheard him mentioning that he was going there to fix her television, he changed his story. He admitted to going to her apartment, but claimed that upon arrival, he realized he didn't have the necessary tool and told Teresita he would return another time to complete the job. Alan then stated that, after leaving Teresita's apartment, he went directly back to his own place. He said that he and Yanka had been experiencing some electrical problems, and he returned home immediately to address the issue. Despite their disbelief at following a tip, Seemingly from a ghost, the detectives began to suspect that they had found the right man. They decided to pause the interview and return to Alan's apartment to speak with his girlfriend, Yanka. Yanka informed them that she was unaware of any electrical problems in their apartment. Even more, she added that Alan wouldn't have even known how to fix such issues if there had been any. The detectives then asked Yanka if Alan had given her any jewelry recently. She replied that he had given her a couple of pieces in February, explaining that they were belated Christmas gifts. She pointed out the pendant she was wearing around her neck and a gold and pearl cocktail ring on her finger. Taking a chance, the detectives asked if she would mind coming down to the police station with them. Like Alan, she agreed, clearly unaware of what was unfolding. Still incredulous about the direction the case was taking, the detectives arranged for individuals who could potentially identify the jewelry to meet them at the station. Those individuals are the same people Remy named while in her trance-like state. Once they arrived, it was confirmed that the jewelry had been stolen from Teresita's apartment, an unbelievable turn of events. Upon being confronted with this information, Alan confessed to the murder. He admitted that he had planned to rob Teresita because he needed money for rent. Since she was expecting him to come and fix her television and was apparently planning to give him theater tickets as a thank you, she willingly let him into her apartment. As soon as she turned her back, Alan attacked. He told the detectives that he stripped off her clothes to make it appear as an assault and then stabbed her once in the chest. His plan to gather enough money for rent failed, as he could only find $30. To make the crime worthwhile, he took some jewelry and then set the fire to cover up his actions. Alan was arrested and charged with Teresita's murder. Despite his confession, he did not plead guilty. Subsequently, the case went to trial on January 21, 1979. Frustratingly, it ended in a hung jury after four weeks. While awaiting retrial in prison, Alan had a change of heart and decided to plead guilty in exchange for a reduced sentence. He received 14 years for murder, four years for robbery, and four years for arson. 
There were rumors that his decision to plead guilty was actually influenced by a visit from Teresita's ghost in prison. But the more plausible reason was that his lawyer advised him it was in his best interest. Ultimately, Allen served only five years before being released on parole. The tale of the ghost who solved her own murder made headlines in newspapers across the United States and Canada. But is that really what happened? The detectives involved in the case seemed to believe it. But perhaps they didn't investigate thoroughly enough. It turns out that Remy and Teresita were not complete strangers. In fact, Remy had also been a respiratory therapist at Edgewater Hospital. While they never worked the same shift, the two of them had met during orientation. Remy also did work with Alan, and some claim she had been afraid of him. Some believe that it's more plausible that Remy suspected Alan of killing Teresita, but was too afraid to go directly to the police. Inventing the story about Teresita's ghost may have been a way for her to tip off the police without revealing her involvement. However, Remy has always vehemently denied fabricating the story. Even if Remy did concoct the tale about being possessed by Teresita, the story did have positive outcomes. A murderer was captured and brought to justice, and Teresita's name has not been forgotten. But to this day, the circumstances surrounding the conclusion of this case remain an unsolved mystery. And whether it's true or not, Teresita Bassa will always be remembered as the woman who solved her own murder.